20 years ago on Sunday, the acquittal of four police officers for the beating of Rodney King set off a wave of race riots in Los Angeles. What progress have the police and the United States made to heal the country's race wounds? You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu. It was a verdict that outraged the African-American community in Los Angeles. The acquittal of four L.A. police officers for the beating of a young black man, Rodney King, 20 years ago, split the city's racial divide wide open. Some said the verdict was like lighting the fuse of a bomb. Years of racial tension boiled over and the wave of looting and violence that followed shocked many in the United States and the wider world. The six days of unrest saw first the California National Guard and then U.S. Marines deployed on the streets of South Central L.A. in an attempt to bring calm to the streets. Dozens of people died and thousands more were injured. The L.A. riots brought into sharp focus the actions of the Los Angeles Police Department and its interactions with the city's ethnic minorities. Race relations throughout the country also came under the spotlight once more. And recent cases such as the shooting death of black teenager Trevon Martin proved that 20 years on, the issue is still a source of tension. The epicenter of the riots was the notorious neighborhood of South Central Los Angeles. Our correspondent Rob Reynolds reports from there. This intersection is the heart of what used to be called South Central Los Angeles. Now the official name for the area is just South LA. This was the flashpoint for the riots that swept over this city 20 years ago. It was the perception of the LAPD as being corrupt, abusive, and racist that really fueled the outrage on the streets that led to the riots two decades ago. In the interim, a series of police chiefs and especially William Bratton, who served until 2009, have made efforts not only to change the image of the LAPD, but also its ethnic makeup and its practices. For example, more than 63% of the force is now made up of non-whites. That's compared with just 41% back in 1992. A new poll out by the Los Angeles Times shows that 70% of the people who live in Los Angeles say they approve of the way the police department does its job. Now, a lot of things have not changed, unfortunately, in this area. One of them is unemployment. It's still very high. The jobs that are available generally pay very low wages. The infrastructure of public transportation in this neighborhood is still woefully inadequate. And uh, young people in uh, school generally, uh, too many of them, drop out before they reach graduation. Uh, and here and there, all around this neighborhood, there are reminders of those riots 20 years ago. There are vacant lots where burned out buildings once stood. And those really are a reminder of the failure of government leaders on all levels to fulfill the promises that they made back then to fully revive and rebuild and restore South Central Los Angeles. So 20 years on from the LA riots, what has changed between US police forces and the country's minority groups? With me to discuss this in the studio is Hubert Williams, president of the Police Foundation and one of the special advisors to the LA Police Commission in the wake of the riots. Next to him, Horace Cooper from Project 21, a group that promotes the views of African-American conservatives. And from Los Angeles, Earl Ofari Hutchinson, a political analyst and author who specializes in race and politics. Gentlemen, welcome to all of you to Thank the you. show. Thank you. you know, when we look at these riots, let's take a look at the toll that the riots took in Los Angeles 20 years ago. The violence lasted for six days. Property damage was estimated at more than a billion dollars. According to the LA Times, 63 people died during the violence and more than 2,000 were injured. 28 African Americans were killed, 19 Latinos, 14 whites and two Asians. Authorities made more than 12,000 arrests, about half of whom were Hispanics. Hubert, let me start with you. Has the LAPD changed in the past 20 years? They've made tremendous changes. Um, you know, first, you mentioned at the beginning that uh, the racial uh, makeup of the departments changed. 62% uh, Caucasian back at the time of the riots, 62% minority today. Uh, I think equally important to that is the, the, the leadership in the police department. Uh, back in the day of the civil disorders, the civil disruptions, uh, Daryl Gates was running the police department. 
he was a, like an, uh, a person that everything had to go through him. He was in total control. You know, the department, uh, Bratton and others have come in and tried to bring in the focus of the community working in conjunction with the people that live in the neighborhoods as the basis for the police operation. And you see from the uh, survey that's done, a large percentage of the public think that L.A. is doing it just right now. So in terms of the way the L.A. Police Department is structured, the way it conducts its business, the makeup of the, of, of the police department, the changes have been dramatic. Okay, let's go to Earl Hutchinson in Los Angeles. Earl, I guess one measure of how much uh, has changed in Los Angeles is to ask the question, could it happen again? Well, could it happen again? Well, you know, who can really predict the future? I'm not a, an astrologer. I'm not a soothsayer. I'm not in the tarot cards or Ouija boards. And that question gets asked. It was asked on the 10th anniversary, the 15th, and the 20th. Let's just say this. The probabilities are no. And uh, I heard Hubert um, mention some of the changes in the LAPD. He's absolutely accurate. There have been many changes in the LAPD. And that's really a starting point because the two most devastating riots uh, in American history, the Watts riot, 1965, the 1992 uh, LA riots, were caused essentially by problems, practices, and the perception and the reality that there was abuse and misconduct unchecked by the LAPD. Well, in the 20 years since then, a lot's happened to change that. Many of the reform measures that Huber talked about and, and some others have come in. However, I, as I heard from your, one of your commentators and analysts on the scene, he also got something else that's a cautionary note. Sometimes the more things change, the more they stay the same. Some of the same conditions are still there. The high unemployment, uh, the, the housing that's still substandard, health care issues, still a problem. Poverty, still in, uh, a problem. You can go through South L.A. today and what you can see is today, 20 years later, some of the same buildings that were burned down where there were lots 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they're still there today. So. You know, a lot of the promises that were made by corporations to come in and remake South L.A., government, both state, local, and national, to spend tons of money on South L.A., many of these were promises that were unfulfilled. So, in essence, the short answer is probably not. The longer answer is we still have to pay very close attention to some of the conditions that were there 20 years ago. Unfortunately, they're still there today. Horace, what is your assessment of what has happened over the past 20 years? You look at it from a very different perspective, don't you? You look at it from the perspective of a b businessman. Well, um, I certainly am sympathetic to that perspective and that uh, investment follows where people feel that there's going to be an opportunity for a reasonable return, that that will be a safe opportunity, and that the uh, community in questions, um, the participants, will freely feel uh, open to come in and participate. I will tell you um, that uh, it appears that there's been a great effort on the part of uh, the citizenry of, of Los Angeles and the greater Los Angeles area to try to respond to the concerns that have been presented. Uh, I also will add, however, that to the degree that the issues that are talked about are the concern, we also have to look at the issues of what are the individuals, what are their motivations, what are their characterizations. People who participated in the lion's share of the uh, attacks and rioting that occurred, according to the local newspaper coverage, it was indicated that those were people who had already had significant number of arrests on their own. So we're not talking about the average person looked, they saw this outcome and this report, and then they decided, I am going to now engage in lawbreaking as a way of responding to it. We've got two separate issues. How do we make sure that our law enforcement people are accountable? And what are we doing to make sure that the people who oftentimes are too frequently prey on the rest of us understand that there will be accountability if they act that way? As long as we keep those two things in tandem, I think you'll see this risk uh, much more uh, minimized. So are you saying that the majority of the rioters were a criminal element that took advantage of the situation? Well, exactly. You, as I mentioned, the, the contemporary coverage indicated that the people who ultimately were arrested were not first-time offenders. In fact, many of them had had multiple arrests. So the, the idea that just being black or just being Latino or just being a minority was a causal agent in the decision to engage in this rioting behavior simply isn't borne out by reality. Okay, but Hubert, does that in any way diminish the fact that there was a great deal of anger among black people in the wake of that verdict? Well, you've got to look at um, 
you know, the history a, a little bit. And I, I think that there's some accuracy. I'm not saying that, that you're inaccurate in, you know, in what you're saying. But it's very difficult to really characterize uh, people as having a high riot, riot potential because they've had been arrested. Uh, the arrest without a conviction doesn't mean anything. It happens to the guilty as well as the innocent. Um, I think to some degree people get caught up in the fervor of the moment and get drawn into a situation that is uh, civil disruption and riots irrespective of whether or not they have um, criminal backgrounds, criminal history. I ran the Newark Police Department uh, during the period of time which we had uh, riots in Newark. Uh, a lot of people uh, were arrested. Uh, they had no uh, criminal backgrounds whatsoever. It, it's really, I think, uh, Horace's focus, if I'm getting you accurate there, is, is what he's saying is that um, th there are people that are committing crimes and have a tendency uh, to uh, capitalize or take advantage on a civil disruption. And they, 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 those people are, are, are factors, but I don't want to cast the net any broader than something like that to get into greater specificity and talk about what the uh, deals, the details were associated with the people that were involved, we'd have to really look at, a, look at it much closer than that. Uh, but I don't think that's your point. Well, I, I, to, to expand some. You know, uh, to let, let me respond. Okay, to uh, the degree, I'll, 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 I'll get to you in a moment. Oh, go ahead, To the Horace. degree that you have two things being watched. One is the community's involvement and oversight in the law enforcement community, uh, the law enforcement activities. That's important. But to the degree that there are individuals or groups that believe that or perceive that their actions can occur with impunity and not have accountability, those two things things must be watched, brought together, and observed. Today, California is taking steps to bring greater diversity, making sure that they're responsive to the interests of the community, but they've also taken steps to see to it that people get the signal, if you are going to engage in lawlessness, there will be responsibility on okay. your part. Okay, let me go to Earl. Earl, go ahead. Okay, I think that's all too simplistic. You know, I was on the ground in L.A. This is looking at the situation from outside in. I was there. I live in South L.A. I literally live one block from where the epicenter is on Florence and Norman. And I got to tell you this. You know, Hubert got it right. There's a long history, and it would take too long to go into that in terms of not only the conditions, but also relations, which were horrible between the LAPD and the community. But in terms of uh, this point about, you know, criminals that were running amok, you know, obviously some of that was there. People always take advantage of situations. No question about that. I don't think anybody's disputing that. But during the six days that I observed, and even before that, I got to tell you, in fact, let me even go back a year before that, many people, law-abiding, solid community folk in the city, in South L.A. and beyond South L.A., they waited very patiently after the King beating, they waited very patiently to see that justice was done. They assumed that the four officers that beat Rodney King that were tried, they would be convicted. After all, you had the videotape, and it seemed that pretty much it was going that way. People were very patient. People were very tolerant at that point. And I'm talking about the broad mass of people. However, because we saw what happened in all the conditions that were leading up to that, in, in terms of the bad conditions there, social economic, bad relations between the LAPD and the community, long history of that. I have to tell you, in the streets, the sense was many people that never, never in their lives would have thought about throwing a rock, throwing a bottle, picking up a gun, picking up a Molotov cocktail, torching the store. Many of them were so outraged, and I'm talking about neighbors and friends and associates, people I knew right. that were so outraged at what happened that they essentially said, you know what, something has got to be, we can't take it anymore. Not that they were supporting law breaking or law breakers. Many of them were there. No question about that. But the but many people were just the rage and the anger was so great that I have to tell you, it was a tremendous groundswell. Things just don't happen in the vacuum. Things just people just don't say one day I'm gonna start a riot. It doesn't happen that way. It's a long train of conditions and abuses and pent up resentment, and that's what we saw. Okay. Hugh, what you were going to say. Well, uh, you know, I, I uh, was there also, but not to the same degree as Earl, and I, I agree with the points he's making. Uh, but l l let me say this, that um, what happened in L.A. Uh, in, uh, 20 years ago has happened many times in our country's history. 
uh, in the 60s, we had 150 riots and civil disorders occur. Kerner Commission was established to look at those riots and civil disorders. They did a huge report on it. In every single instance, it occurred, the, the, the spark that set the flame on fire was some interaction between the police and the public. So the big underlying question with all of this is what is going on between the police and the minority community that uh, sparks these kind of problems and what can be done about it? If you look at the police and the role and responsibility of the police, it is to uphold the rule of law right. through the enforcement of the law. But you but, know, in but this, wait, let me, let right, me finish. Okay. But we must remember mm -hmm. that the police had to enforce laws also that were unjust and in, uh, discriminatory. And the further back you go in our history, the deeper it gets. It happened in slavery, it happened in segregation, it happened with discrimination. The police have to, had to enforce the law. That's their role. Right. And the, the enforcing the law against minorities was different than enforcing the law against my majority. And that pattern that has occurred then still reflects and manifests itself today to a much lesser degree, but it's embedded in the, in, in the culture in the way some people operate on tradition. And I say, and I made the point earlier, that the police have changed because if you look at the leadership in policing across America today, the, the, the leadership, 95% in the survey that we, we did, embrace community policing, a partnership between the community and the police, working together to resolve crime-related and public safety problems. Yeah. And this has been a, a, an important development in American history. It's been led by the police. Right. The police have been a catalyst for change. Mm -hmm. But it's not uh, a proper to just skin across the surface at the positive sides of what has happened and yeah. not look more deeply at the problematic part as well. Okay, one well, of the things, I just want to sort of ask Hubert this, one of the things we often hear is that the police are only as successful as the cooperation they get from the community they're policing. Has that changed in Los Angeles? I, I, I would say when you get 70% of the public saying that you're doing it right, it has had to have changed. It's changed, and it's changed in significant ways. Okay. I would say it's a bit of a shibboleth to uh, say that the issue here is primarily how law enforcement community has provoked uh, the rest of the citizenry at large. Um, when I look at proposals, um, uh, you said rightly that uh, the law enforcement community carries out the law that the uh, community has established for them. Sometimes you've said that they were asked to do things that were either unjust, unconstitutional, or, or illegal, and they went forward with it. Why, if we believe that, and that that's the basis for the provocation, why do we continue to expand the reasons for law enforcement to have interactions with people? I look just today, just today, the Department of Transportation announced that they would like the federal government to impose on every state a requirement that no one be allowed to use their cell phone while they're driving. That would be open season for law enforcement all over the country to pull people over. I haven't heard our group, we objected, we raised concerns. I haven't heard from one civil rights group raise this particular issue. And it tells me, and I can look over a 20-year period, law enforcement gets asked to do this and this and this and this. We don't hear a peep from the civil rights community, and it makes it clear they don't really believe that the problem is provocation from law enforcement. You were a teenager 20 years ago, weren't you? Yeah. I was paying attention. Well, I know. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, just in terms you know, of uh, yeah. your experience. One moment, I'll get to you. Your experience uh, in these matters, you're going basically through analyses and what you've read and maybe what people told you, like secondhand yeah. information. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I appreciate the observation. <laughs> what I decided to do as an adult is not sit back and do the kinds of things that people my parents' age but, did, which was to ignore, well, overlook, you know, uh, or okay. collaborate well, Wayne, with. Can I, I won't your, allow it. Can I address, okay, let's go to, uh, go can ahead. I address your, can I address your point about the civil rights leaders yeah. and uh, organizers and activists not addressing police provocation. That's not true. The fact of the matter is we have an organization, many organizations out here, long before Rodney King, long before the L.A. riots, 
uh, going a long history, and Hubert, I'm certain that you know this since you Absolutely. go back into the 60s, Absolutely. going all the way back actually to uh, Bill Parker when he was chief. Uh, and that's in the mid-60s. You had the NAACP, you had the Urban League, you had back then, you had the Congress of Racial Equality, you had the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, continually, and even to an extent, the Nation of Islam. Malcolm X came out to L.A. several times after police shootings and police uh, issues of police misconduct, challenging the LAPD. So there's, there's a long history of civil rights activists taking an active issue, engaging the police on a range of issues. And by the way, not just violence and misconduct, but actually reform-minded issues that uh, civil rights activists have proposed to uh, not only the L.A. Police Department, but also city officials, too. And we've always had in Los Angeles the Los Angeles Police Commission. So I can't tell you how many times that when they've had meetings, when they've had forums, when they've had uh, open-ended discussions with community leaders and civil rights leaders, they have been there proposing changes. The problem has been, uh, Hubert, as you well know, before 1992 when the reform, the major reform efforts came in, whether it was Daryl J. Uh, Gates or Chiefs before that, they didn't listen because in their mind there was a wall, a separation between them and the community. That's where you heard the term us versus them. And by the way, that was not a perception. I'm here to tell you that was a reality. Okay. Let's look at some figures here, you know, and how much has changed in the past 20 years. Are black citizens in the United States still subject to racial profiling? Now, there was, in 2008, a study done by the Bureau of Justice Statistics, and it found that although black, white, and Hispanic motorists were stopped at similar rates by the police, African Americans were three times as likely as white drivers and twice as likely as Hispanics to be searched during a traffic stop. Two Democratic lawmakers have introduced bills in Congress to end racial profiling. And New York City police face a lawsuit that claims that 85% of people investigated under their so-called stop, question, and frisk policy are black or Latino. Hubert. Look, um, when, you look when you talk about racial profiling, mm -hmm. what we're talking about is police officers acting on the basis of perception as opposed to behavior. Police officers are, are taught to deal with violations of the rule of law. When you start targeting people because of the way they look that's driving a car, but the vehicle is not being uh, driven uh, improperly or against the law and you pull them over, well, that I would classify as ha could be a racial profiling incident. Right. These things happen. They continue to happen. Uh, but they happen to a much lesser degree. And the key there, and you made the point earlier, is accountability. Police have to be held accountable when they violate rules, when they breach the standards of the law. They have to be held accountable. Right. And what we've seen occur over the years in police departments is increased accountability. Police leadership are taking an increased focus on this. But it is embedded, I think, in some, look, we have race problems in America. Mm -hmm. But all Americans don't have race problems. Some Americans get along quite uh, good with everybody. Right. But there are people that have these uh, racial issues. When they put on a uniform and a badge, it gives them a sense of power. They can do things that other people can't do. And, and that's why there's got to be a strict accountability because the standard of care for anybody having a badge and a gun ha is high. And, and, and officers have to be held accountable. I think it's occurring, occurring uh, better and better. There's still problems, and every police chief would admit it. Okay. Horace? Since I have been a teenager and paying attention and becoming a full-fledged adult, I have watched, and instead of saying that people who abuse discretion, we're going to take discretion away from you and limit what you can do, there has been a wholesale adding of discretion. There are far more reasons today for law enforcement people to encounter innocent individuals, black or white, today than at any time in the existence of this country, and greater than when I was a teenager. Who has sat there silently and allowed that to continue? And so I call those groups out. Well, if you really do believe that there is a provocation that is caused by abusive law enforcement community, it would seem there would be a willingness to have a time out. Let's not expand responsibilities. Let's not expand encounter opportunities. Let's restrict. Okay, and you get the last word. I'm afraid we've run out of time. Earl Hutchinson, Hubert Williams, Horace Cooper, thanks to all of you for joining us. Thank you. And Thank you for inviting that us. is it from Thank the you, team Earl. in Washington, D.C. for now.
Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook where you can find more information about the program. And of course, we want to hear from you. Tell us what stories you think we should be covering. Send us your ideas directly to us at InsideStory at AlJazeera.net. Thanks for watching.